1998 will go down in history as the summer of the home run chase. Sammy Sosa and Mark McGuire went head-to-head chasing Roger Maris's seemingly unbreakable 37-year-old record of 61 home runs. That season, McGuire, who seemed to hit a home run every other day, would annihilate Maris's record and set his own by hitting 70 home runs. One day in June, however, Big Mac met his match. His name? Hi, I'm Bob Tewksbury. That's right, Bob Tewksbury, also known as Tewks. This is Gone, Untold Stories of America's Pastime. I'm your host, Manny Gomez. Bob Tewksbury wasn't your ordinary pitcher. With a fastball that maxed out in the mid-80s and a wicked curveball, Tewks was never going to throw it past you. Instead, he got by with guile. You see, Tewks wasn't afraid to pitch to contact. And believe me, there were times where he got hit hard. In fact, Tewks ranks 561st all-time in hits per nine. That's out of just 580 pitchers with a minimum 1,500 innings pitched. By the same token, he ranks second all-time, post-1920, in walks per nine, first in the DH era, by a lot. Most importantly, Tewksbury was a gamer, and he wasn't afraid to pitch to anybody. That includes Big Mac Mark McGuire. This is Episode 2, The Ephus, a David and Goliath story. In 1997, when Bob Tewksbury was a member of the Minnesota Twins and Mark McGuire a member of the Oakland Athletics, Tewksbury faced off against McGuire at home. Luck would have it that a previous teammate of McGuire's, Terry Steinbach, was now with the Twins catching Bob Tewksbury. In the pregame meeting to go over the batters, Steinbach had talked about staying away from McGuire, throwing fastballs away from McGuire. That would be the best place for me to pitch him. Simple enough, right? Wrong. You see, after getting ahead in the count with one ball and two strikes, Tukes completely abandoned the game plan. And decided to throw him a fastball in. Well, I threw him a fastball that didn't quite get in, but it, it landed on top of the center field man, center field cameraman's camera and um, I'll never forget Terry Stombach called timeout and he brought the ball from the home plate umpire out with him to the mound and didn't lift up his mask and said didn't get it in did you (laughs) and he turned around and walked back to home plate many times an event like this gets seared in your memory it starts to work against you not for Tewksbury A year later, in 1998, Tukes was to face the St. Louis Cardinals and Big Mac once again. And it's June, and now Mark McGuire is a member of the Cardinals, and he's hitting a lot of home runs. And as I'm getting ready to pitch against the Cardinals and Mark McGuire, uh, a neighbor of mine comes up to me the night before and says, so you're not going to pitch to McGuire tomorrow, are you? And I said, well, why not? He goes, well, he's hitting all these home runs. <laughs> you got to walk them. And I said, Mike, 30,000 people are not coming to the Metrodome tomorrow to watch me walk Mark McGuire. I'm going to pitch to him. You see, Bob Tewksbury had an arsenal of strategies which he explicitly details in his latest book, 90% Mental. So the night before, uh, my preparation starts for the day of the game. And during that time, I uh, you know, watched the game and then do some imagery work in the hotel room uh, that night uh, leading up to my start, which would be the next day. And that was listening to music or just imagining myself pitching, but putting myself into a a relaxed state that I could create the pictures and images that I needed to pitch against the team I was going to face the next day. When the next day came around, there's a um, pregame meeting, 
to go over how we're going to pitch to the uh, opposing hitters to check on the, any lineup changes. And so that's a time I use my journaling to reflect back on what players may have done against me in the, in the past and how I pitched them. So that was a great way for me to, to keep record of, of how I did against certain players, not what the other parts of the league did. It was important for me to know what I did. Two things stand out here. First, Tewksbury utilized something called mental imagery. In this exercise, which is a form of meditation, you envision yourself succeeding in a situation. Tewksbury says it best in his book when he says, quote, the body doesn't know the difference between a real or imagined event, and therefore, the body will go where the mind takes it. The second thing Tewksbury relied on was journaling. I learned from my notes in my journal to not throw Mark McGuire fastballs in. What I did throw McGuire was my pitch called by signals the two finger wiggle, aka the Ephus. So I had a couple of variations on the name of this. One was the Dominator because no one hit it. Two was the two fingered wiggle because that was the sign the catcher gave me. And it's most commonly known as the Ephus. The two finger wiggle better known as the Ephus, was invented by Pirates pitcher Rip Sewell back in the 1930s. It is basically a lob pitch intended to catch an anxious batter off guard. My favorite part of the Ephus pitch, aside from its insane arch and slow speed, it's the insanely creative nicknames people attribute to it. Bill Lee referred to it as the space ball, while Dave LaRoche called it the la lob. And who could forget Steve Hamilton's folly floater? I mean, who comes up with this stuff? John Sterling renamed El Duque's Ephus El Drapo. And now we have Bob Tewksbury's Two Finger Wiggle, a.k.a. The Dominator. Let's take a moment to find out how Tooks threw his pitch. So here's, here's the Ephus description of an Ephus. There was a pitch... Uh, called the, the Lob. Dave LaRoche threw the Lob. He was my pitching coach with the Yankees. Um, and it was more of just a big lob pitch. It had backspin on it. So when you throw your fastball, the ball comes off your hand and the spin rotates backwards. The curveball, when you throw a curveball, your hand comes forward and the ball creates forward spin. Kind of like if you were to grab the ends of a tennis can and throw a tennis can it would spin forward. So my Ephus pitch was really a, just a slow curveball. I held it like a curveball, I threw it like a curveball, but the best way to describe it was that when I got right to that point where I was gonna release the pitch, I just kinda turned off the engine, if you will, and lobbed it up there. And so it had forward spin, it, it would break down and it didn't, it didn't fall down to gravity. Well, I guess it did, but the rotation of the spin is what allowed it to be really a curveball and not a lob pitch. But that's what my Ephus, a.k.a. two-finger wiggle dominator was. Tooks wasn't afraid to use it either. He used it on Albert Bell, who had a notorious reputation for not being too friendly. Oh, I, uh, Albert Bell was going to kill me for throwing him the Ephus. I used it a lot in certain situations. Another story at the Metrodome, Albert Bell is playing for the White Sox. There's a guy on second, I believe, and there's there's two outs, and the count's 3-0. and oh. So I don't care if I walk Albert Bell. I throw him a big, slow curveball for strike one, uh, the, I, it was a slow curveball. It wasn't the, really the Ephus. So the count's three and one. So the next one I throw is a big curveball for strike two. The count's three and two. Now I throw the Ephus, and he swung, he swung at it, and it about hit his knuckles, and he hit a soft little looper to Pat Mears at shortstop. Well, Robin Ventura was the next hitter. And he came up to home plate and he told the catcher something. And then I can't remember what happened to Ventura. But after the inning, when Terry Steinbach and I went back to sit in the dugout, Terry came up to me and said, 
you want to know what Robin said to me? And I go, yeah, what were you guys talking about? And he said, Albert wants to kill you. You might want to get an escort out of the parking lot to, to get to your car. And then there's Manny Ramirez. The, the guy who hit it the hardest was Manny Ramirez. We were in Cleveland. And uh, it was probably would have been 97, 8. And I, he, it didn't fool him. He hit it hard. And, uh, but he hit it to the center fielder. That's not to say that Tooks abused the pitch either. There was a time and a place to use it. Well, you got to be selective when to use it. You know, you can't overexpose it. And, uh, and that's why I threw it sparingly and I threw it at, at the times that I felt were going to be most effective. So you can't overexpose such a deadly weapon like that. And now we're back to June of 1998. David was about to face off against Goliath. And the memory of Big Mac's towering shot was seared into Tukes' memory. So what does Tukes decide to do? Find out after the break. The presenting sponsor of Gone, Untold Stories of America's Pastime, is Audible. Go to audibletrial.com forward slash gone pod to get a 30-day free trial and a free audio book download. Don't like the book? You can swap it for free. Cancel any time and you can listen on any of your devices anywhere at any time. That's audibletrial.com forward slash G-O-N-E-P-O-D. And now, back to the show. So we were in a pregame meeting in the same locker room up in Minnesota at the Metrodome going over the hitters, and I made a uh, comment that if I got the first two guys out of the inning, I was going to throw the Ephus the two-finger wiggle dominator to Mark McGuire. At this point in the season, Mark McGuire had played 73 games and had hit 36 home runs. He was literally hitting a home run every other game. Big Mac had a 313 batting average and a Ruthian 791 slugging percentage. Anything in his wheelhouse was almost certainly going to end up over the wall. Bob Tewksbury recalls his teammates' reaction to his decision to pitch to Mac. Well, there's usually about half the bullpen stays up in the clubhouse in the first inning, and there's 44 steps from the old Metrodome locker room down to the field. Well, after the first two guys were out, <laughs> we heard a whole bunch of those guys running down the steps to the dugout to witness my throwing the ephus to McGuire. Picture this. Mark McGuire steps into the batter's box at the old Metrodome. He resembles Paul Bunyan with bulging biceps, the bat more like an axe. Tewksbury gets the two-finger wiggle from catcher Terry Steinbach and readies his windup. He throws. The pitch sails high above McGuire's head and falls in for a strike. The pitch is clocked at 47 miles an hour. And then I threw him another one. And this time, McGuire swung and hit a feeble ground ball to first base. And I remember going to cover first, thinking, he's going to kill me. But he's kind of smirked. McGuire was an imposing figure, standing at six foot five and 250 pounds of pure muscle. In many ways, Tooks felt like he got away with one. What's more, McGuire had just done Tooks a solid. Because it was at the same time, I had actually painted a lithograph of Mark McGuire and Ken Griffey Jr. that was being sold to raise money for the Boys and Girls Clubs of America. And the, Mark had the, agreed to sign 100 copies of this limited edition print. And he had just received them in St. Louis. And I'm throwing him Ephus curveballs. <laughs> so, so I thought he was not going to be happy. With that in mind, what does Tewksbury decide to do the next time McGuire comes up? Well, the next time up, I had success with it the first time, so why not throw it again? So I, again, I threw the whoop, lollipop, Ephus. McGuire took it, I believe, but I threw it to him again, and he hit a little pop-up to second base. McGuire is now 0 for 2 against Tewksbury and the old two-finger wiggle, a.k.a. the Dominator. The third time up, I threw him my quote-unquote hard curveball at 70 miles an hour. 
and he got a base hit to left. So there you have it. Baseball's modern-day Babe Ruth. One of two men responsible for bringing the game back to prominence after a devastating strike, facing off against a guy who maxes out in the mid-80s. And in an act of showmanship, Tewksbury manages to put out Big Mac not once, but twice on a 47-mile-an-hour pitch called the Dominator. You can't make this stuff up. But after the game, I sent him over a note in the clubhouse that said, Mac, I hope you were not uh, mad at me for throwing those pitches. I was just trying to have some fun and get you out. And he sent over a note back that said, Tukes, I'm a sucker for those. I would have swung at them all day long. Your friend, Mark McGuire. So how does a guy from New Hampshire the product of Rutgers University in New Brunswick, New Jersey, and St. Leo College in St. Leo, Florida, a guy who admittedly doesn't have the best stuff, managed not only to make it to the big leagues, but to sustain a 13-year career. In his book, 90% Mental, Bob Tewksbury touches on something that we can all learn from. We all, all of us, fail. It's how we handle that failure that determines our greatness, you can either focus on the negative, tell yourself that you're no good, that you can't do it, or you can focus on the positive, as Tewksbury did in his matchups against McGuire. A line sticks out from Bob Tewksbury's book, 90% Mental. In it, Took says, if you can conceive it in your mind, believe it in your heart, you can achieve it. There's no doubt in my mind that Tewksbury believed he could take McGuire. And he did. Hi, everybody. Bob Tewksbury here. I just want to say thank you for purchasing and reading 90% Mental. An all-star player turned mental skills coach reveals the hidden game of baseball with my co-writer, Scott Miller. I think you'll see a unique side of the game, and I hope you thoroughly enjoy it. God bless. This is a Welcome to the Show production. Make sure to visit wttspod.com forward slash gone pod to get more information on this episode. Special thanks to Bob Tewksbury. Make sure to visit audibletrial.com forward slash gone pod to get your free audio version of Bob Tewksbury's 90% Mental. I'm your host, Manny Gomez. Follow me on Twitter at MannyGo3. Peace.